Hello? Right then, so I think I fixed the problem with my sound. And that combined with the joyous thing that has been various activities going on this evening, I meant I'm recording this rather late. So, this will probably be put up late. I will record this the night before, check it in the morning. Hopefully it's good enough, and then I'll go live. So, could Crete have been saved in 1941? Well, that's the question we're going to be answering in today's live. But, more importantly, it's a question which I've been considering. And I started off by doing my regular thing, which is to look at the orders of battle. To look at them and to consider them and to consider what they exactly bring to the battle, what those orders of battle bring into it. And in the end, I threw them out. I will possibly put the orders of battle slides back in for the live. I'll possibly have them there. But I got rid of them because they honestly, the order of battle doesn't matter. If you look at the order of battle, even the British don't have complete units out there. They are mostly elements of them. Even you know, if you can take the MNBDO, uh, the Royal Marine-led Royal Navy force, which is out there to support the base, it's eight thousand strong. Two thousand two hundred are on Crete. You take Fourteenth Brigade. They're the only really full strength. Or sort of full strength formation, but their whole division there, but their whole division isn't there with them. The rest of the division was held back in Egypt. They were supposed to be a whole division there. A moderate division deployed in November. Then you've got the New Zealand troops, of which whole units from their brigades get sent back to Alexandria. And then you have the German units showing up. Well they're already themselves have been used, they're not really all that full strength or, you know, with their full equipment. And then you've got the fact their own actual deployment, the whole nature of the airborne attack and the way so many of their attacks do actually get gutted. It's not about the order of battle. It should be about the order of battle. But on the order of battle, the British should have won. They should have. Simply but there is a huge disparity in numbers. The British should have won. But they don't. And to be honest, the handling of the airborne forces means that they shouldn't have won either. We'll get into that. So, a little backstory. I'm going to disappear for a second. The Battle of Greece was absolutely terrible. It was completely and utterly terrible. You couldn't imagine a worse run campaign. But in many ways it's understandable because the Greek government had been trying to avoid war and they hadn't really done enough preparations for it because they hadn't been able to. Okay, It just hadn't been the Allied forces landed in Greece were, again, deployed horribly. <laughs> they were trying to react to fix it, fill gaps and put them in and they just, it just didn't work. It didn't. So by 1941 you have this scenario. The world is not easy. France has fallen. Japan's not in the war. America's a benevolent neutral. Canada is pumping up escorts and victory ships as fast as she can build them. Britain is pumping out destroyers as fast as it can build them. But it's 1941. It finally realized the war's not going to be quick or easy. They've started working on battleships and aircraft carriers again. Thank the Lord. 
Australia, New Zealand are all gearing up and have been gearing up for a while and are sending out troops and they're all fighting together in this what is this European war again. And it is pretty much European centric at this point. But it's not going well. And it's not being straightforward by any stretch of the imagination. So why does Crete matter? Well, it's simple. Crete's in the middle of somewhere. You've heard about places in the middle of nowhere. Well, Crete is in the middle of somewhere. Crete is in the middle of the Eastern Mediterranean. With it, you make the job of supplying Malta a lot easier. You make the job of getting into the Adriatic a lot easier. You get to make a job of uh, blocking off the Aegean a lot easier. You make the ability to protect forces in Egypt a lot easier. If you, c it's it's like Iceland for the NATO forces. If you can forward deploy air defence assets, etc., in Crete, you can block a whole swathe of attacks coming on your forces if you're the British. If you're the Axis powers, though, and you have Crete, the reverse is true. You can bring a whole swathe more attacks to bear on the British when they're moving their convoys around. You can make the operation of naval assets far, far more difficult. You can threaten Cyprus. You can threaten an invasion of Egypt. You certainly prevent the British being able to launch their planned attack on roads. You gain a supporting base which you don't have to supply by sending ships all the way across the Mediterranean to support your forces fighting in North Africa at the critical area of North Africa. So, Crete, the middle of somewhere. So, being so important, it's unsurprising that British forces start to arrive in November 1940. What is disturbing is how little they do to really prepare the island between November 1940 and the invasion in May 1941. For starters, you would have thought there would have been a main road built up. There is a road, but an actual proper heavy goods road made between Sifakaris and the north of the island. You'd also thought that there would have been far more road transport landed considering the British army and the armies which depended on it for their organisation, i.e. New Zealand, Australian, Canadian, were also mechanised and motorised. And actually the biggest problem for the British forces deployed in Crete was their lack of motor transport and was the quality of the roads because they have enough troops there. To be honest, they could have won the war by just moving a company, but well, not the war, but the battle by just moving a company at the bit before it even started, but they didn't. But you could have still won it if you'd been able to move enough troops to do a proper counterattack. They couldn't. All the time that this is going on, there are fights happening in the Mediterranean. For example, here you go, 14th destroyer flotilla. Of course, I'm going to talk about it. it involves tribal class destroyers. Are really having fun on the 15th of April with some resupplies for the Africa Corps. The Tarigo convoy, and they sink them all. Um, March 24th, even as British troops are being deployed, British and Empire troops are being deployed to Greece, Cunningham is almost being automatically being ordered to start planning for their evacuation of Greece. And the plan has two ideas. One, you're going to be pulling troops back straight to Egypt. 
and two, you're going to be pulling troops back to Crete. And the idea is you pull troops back to Crete, and then you have a relay service going between Greece and Crete, because Crete's so much closer to Greece. You have a relay service going between Crete and Egypt. And so you make sure you build up homogenous units on Crete to secure Crete. And you pull back homogenous units to Egypt. It all makes sense on paper. Unfortunately, Greece is not that organized. And that's not being nasty about the Greece, Greeks. It's the whole battle. It disorganized as anything. It's kind of like Crete will be, but on a bigger scale. The first big loss for the Greek army is really the 223,000 soldiers caught in Albania on April 21st. If they hadn't been, then the 22nd might not have taken place as it did. But as it is, that's a large chunk of the better part of the Greek army off the board. Hence, on the 23rd, the Greek government is evacuated to Crete, which Churchill is determined to defend. And once again, he makes a promise. He makes a promise to everyone, pretty much. Uh, Cunning was told specifically by the First Sea Lord in a personal signal on March 24th that when agreeing to the use of New Zealand and Australian troops, the government had asked that adequate arrangements be made in advance to withdraw the troops in case of necessity. He will make this promise again about Crete. In fact, Churchill's always making this promise. Thank goodness for the Royal Navy, they tend to deliver on them. But let's look at map. Oh, sorry. I forgot. We have some people here. Wavell is the army commander overall for the region. I haven't got the air commander or Cunningham in here because, frankly, the air commander, the air forces, as far as the British are concerned, get withdrawn fairly early. And Admiral Cunningham, I've talked about in enough videos. You all know how great he is. He really does pull some stuff off in this battle. And then there's Freyberg. The, one of the people I feel most sorry for in the entire of World War II. Because he's lumbered with the loss of Crete and really... He shouldn't be. I can't find a picture of Major General Weston. The commander of the... Uh, Mobile Naval Base Detachment Organization or Defense Organization. Honestly, I think he should have been deployed. He was a Major General. Uh, again, his force had started arriving a lot earlier on Crete than anyone else did. He was being sent there. Medellin never gets up the full 8,000 there, but well, at the beginning of April, they definitely are getting sent there. And there's already 14th Brigade there. In a sensible world, you'd probably you put all 8,000 of the Monab there, uh, and you'd have had 14th Brigade and probably one of their sister brigades from 6th Division sent over there, and that would have formed quite a homogenous force to build a defence round. Then you'd have brought in the, four, uh, the New Zealand, 2nd New Zealand Division, and I would have probably put Left Western in charge. I'd have put the Royal Marine General in charge. Mainly because he has a huge staff organization is capable of doing this sort of thing. Neither 2nd Division nor any other unit would turn up with a necessary staff to run a divisional level battle. And that makes a big difference. You can be the best commander in the world, but if you haven't got a staff that can gather the information you need, can process the information, can distribute out communications and orders and organize things for you as you need them done, you can't be a one-man band in a modern battle. You just can't. So, you know. So the Battle of Crete, 1941. And I know people don't like, well, not everyone likes blocks of text, but um, sometimes it's useful to have a block of text. And the reason I've got the blocks of text is because, in this case, there's some cute quotes. And again, link to them is down below. General Wilson replied to General Wavell that he and Major General C.E.C. Weston 
the commander of the MMD BDO, considered that in the face of enemy air superiority, it would be difficult for the Navy to deal with seaborne landings that would probably be made in addition to the landings by air. If all the potential beaches were to be held, the defences would be very much stretched. In all, General Wilson thought that at least three brigade groups, each of four battalions, were needed, plus a motor battalion and the MNBDO. He added that unless all three services are prepared to face the strain of maintaining adequate forces up to strength, the holding of the island is a dangerous commitment and a decision on the matter must be taken once. As he had already been warned about the weakness of the Royal Air Force, this was tantamount to saying that he did not think the island could be successfully defended. Wilson is the general who precedes um, Freiburg in command, but he doesn't say that. Well, it's too long. In fact, he's there for roughly three days because on the 3rd of April, General Wavell flew to Crete and held a conference of senior officers. He made it clear that Crete was to be held in order to deny it to the enemy as an airbase. The probable objectives would be Hurricane and Malham airfields. No additional air support could be forthcoming. The force could, would be commanded by General Freiburg. Wilson was hurried off to take command in Palestine to cope with a crisis in Iraq and German activities in Syria. Why? Okay, I can understand you taking Wilson away, but Freiburg has literally just got there. You've got Weston, who has been Wavell, uh, Wilson's second in command. I, Wilson is a far more senior general, so I can understand him being put in charge in 27. I can understand that. Okay? Yeah, he arrives. But you've had Weston, who's been there before Wilson, is there after Wilson. He's the most well briefed of all the generals left on the island, the most used to Crete, the one who understands the scenario best, and he's not put in charge, it's given to poor Freiburg, who doesn't have a staff, who can't request the staff off the NBDO because Weston had been adapting them as he went, but that was one of the few advantages he had was staff, and considering Freiburg was going to need him to do what the name MBDO did, he couldn't afford to take their staff from He didn't have second division staff of him. It's a nightmare. So, here is the Battle of Crete. And the first thing you're going to notice is that the convoys don't make it through. The convoys don't. The Royal Navy turns them back. Why? Because they're using cakes, because those sh the vessels available, despite them having tons of amphibious shipping, literally thousands of tons of it, are slow, and they take more than a day to get to the islands, which means they're out at night, and at night the Royal Navy rules the oceans, even in their training. They can, in the night time, really do their jobs, and they do. Now, the interesting thing is you have the German parachute and mountain troops are given a figure of 22,750 in this map. 7,000 of those failed to arrive. So that would make it 15,000. There are 3,000 Italians who arrived at one point, so yeah, that's 18,000. The British Commonwealth troops have about 13,000. And again, it's this is 1,941 for the Royal Marines and MNBDO, but their total force of there is about 2,200, and that's according to their records, so I'm going to trust them. New Zealand Division, 7,704. Australian, 6,540. British Army. A cool 15,063, plus 10,000 Greek troops. So you have technically an allied force of 40,000 facing off against 15,000 who won't all arrive in one go. Sorry. 
it's just the whole problem uh, we can start talking about the problem being it's one of transport and that is the whole thing once you're in the counter-attack phase once you're in the fighting battle phase the lack of transport is the big killer but in the first phase in the first start of the operation the Germans have to take air bases The fur in order, he made it clear that Crete had to be held in order to deny it to the enemy as an airbase. The proper objectives would be Hurricane and Malam airfields. Airfields. The proper objectives. I, 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 this is an official report. I'm fairly sure Wavell gave a lot more reports because he was fairly connected to net uh, to. Um, to the work of Bletchley Park and to all the information coming through from the intercepts of the Enigma. So, he knew that he's giving the stronger team to So basically, it's secure the airfields. You've got, whilst not homogenous brigades, you have got a good few brigades, enough brigades do this, that you can start securing those airfields. And that is, broadly speaking, the plan they go with. They do put a brigade near each field. If we look at this map again, You can quite easily, quite easily see that the 14th Brigade is at Herlikon. It had been there for most of since November 1940, so it should it is well dug in and should be theoretically therefore able to hold its positions. You've got the 19th Brigade. Dagnerevan, another airfield, and then you've got all sorts of these New Zealand formations and Great British formations are sitting around Gatos, Marlem, Kanekan, Suda Bay, and the MMBDO. You've got whole sorts of formations here. You've got full brigades. All they have to do is hold their airfield. And really, the airfield you most have to hold is this one. It's Malam. Sorry, I'm pointing to it, but the, the one up above me. There. Because if you can hold that one, that's the closest. Now, as I said, one of the interesting things I find is that it, despite being there since November 1940 again, Safakia on the south of the island is quite a decent sized place for ships to come into and it will be used as part of the evacuation. Why there wasn't a decent road laid between November or a decent enough road, a military decent road, put in place between November and 1940 and May 1941, I do not know. Yes, heavy plants and all these things are difficult to come by, but this island is quite a central island. I thought for logistics of supporting air operations, it would have been sensible because that gives you a ba naval base on the other side of the land, further away from potential enemy actions. Gives you an easier and quicker resupply as well from Egypt. But there wasn't. There was a lot of things which weren't. The coulda, woulda, shoulda is the motto of Crete. So, Hamlet, the last reinforcements arrive on May the 16th. Technically a few more turn up, but yeah, that's the last major reinforcements. Some further British units are deployed, but you know, 
they're mostly trying to stabilize you it and it doesn't really go that well 19th Freiburg's orders the last airworthy aircraft to be flown out of Crete there have been non-stop operations I have a great little thing I can read let's see where is it Sorry about this. I scroll past it on my own notes. Ah, there it is. No RAF units were based permanently in Crete until April 1941, but airfield construction had begun, radar sites built, and still was developed. Equipment was scarce in the Mediterranean, and Crete is even a backwater. And Mediterranean is far less of a priority than that of Britain. Crete is even less so. It had had seven commanders, uh, seven British commanders, in seven months at Chingri. And the airfields at Malem and Hurricane and landing strip at Rifa on the north coast were ready. Another strip at Peda Castella was nearly finished. And frankly, these were all lovely positions for the German attacks. The idea had been to base 30 Blenheim bombers and to put about 25,000 British and Dominion troops on the island and then relieve those from W force in Greece and then relieve those with troops from Egypt. It didn't happen. In fact, they slowly get worn down and you have 30 squadron, 80 squadron, 1 and 2 squadron and I think it's 805 squadron of the fleet air arm um, keep fighting they had roughly four squadrons with two dozen aircraft between them and they get worn down and down and down and down until there's pretty much a handful left about seven from that point on they're just not a practical force really and so they are in terms of what Freyberg is thinking about them for. He's thinking about them in terms of air defense of the island against bomber groups. And he's probably sensible. They are not enough. However, and this is me thinking with my Serbian hat on, <laughs> No relation, but looking at thinking of what they did in Kosovo and in the Bosnian War, they were excellent at hiding equipment. And you cannot tell me that the British couldn't have had its remaining aircraft in the airfields and sent them up when the German air convoys were inbound. Because again, intercepting their air convoys, even if you only managed to slightly disrupt their JU-52s, or shoot down a few of those, will have a big knock-on impact. There's also limited air defence on the island, and again, the heaviest guns and air defence guns are actually all supplied by the MMBDO. So Suda Bay is well protected. And there's a few other guns spread around, but some of the sectors do not have any air defence. Also, why is there no ripping up of the existing airfields going on? If you can't defend them, you can't operate aircraft on them, plough them up. Daniel puts this. Uh, Daniel Freeman put this better than me when he was taking part in our sort of recordings, and I will get them out, but yes, they should have been ploughed up. Because they weren't going to be used if you weren't going to retain any fighters. Send in the ploughs. It's fairly easy to fix them afterwards. But it stops them being able to be used easily by the Germans. 
also be good if you ploughed off other areas which are flat enough and could be used. Next day the Germans gain control, uh, Operation 20th, Operation Mecca begins and next day can, Germans gain control of Malami. But during this whole time the, the seaborne attacks don't get there. They take so long they get intercepted on the way. They just do. It's just... So, let's look at Milani. Let's look at what goes wrong here, because here is the point at which it could have been saved. So, as you can see, this is the New Zealand positions according to the New Zealand government. You have 22nd Battalion sitting around the airfield area. You have 23rd Battalion in the centre of the lines, 21st Battalion. Down below, the engineering department, off on their own, covering a bridge, and then you have the Maori Battalion. Now, the river bread, uh, bed you see to your, the Terranosis, I think, uh, next to the airfield in 22nd Battalion sector, is where the Germans will land. It's where the Germans managed to get in. And it's from there the Germans managed to attack, attack the airfield. So. There are some issues. They managed to... Uh, the Germans do manage to, uh, manage to cut off communications between some of the external companies and the headquarters of 22 Brigade, which is set quite far back from them. And this causes the brigade, uh, the company, uh, the battalion commander to order their withdrawal because he thinks they're cut off, surrounded, which means they abandon Hill 107, which is the high point in the area, and without control of it, you can't control the airfield. He, the Germans get in position, the attack that's supposed to go in that night to recover the position doesn't go until the following morning, it's delayed, it lacks heavy equipment, and they get repulsed. And the Germans keep bringing in more supplies, and then they get the airfield, and then they're bringing in more supplies. And that's the problem. So, how do you fix Malemi? Well, the trouble is the positions that are the forces on couldn't really dominate the riverbed so you could always plow up the riverbed and you could it's dry at this point of the time of year but also possibly and this is to an extent how i would have probably done it i would have used the engineering department rather than using them as poorly trained riflemen i would have had them doing engineering and doing some plowing work, and those sort of things. But I'd have also moved probably C Company of the Maori Battalion and C Company of 21 Battalion and C Company of 23 Battalion, those three C Companies. And I would have not just reinforce 22nd Battalion to make it far stronger and given myself a brigade reserve based in that area I would have and also I'd have probably had my brigade HQ over in that area because that's the critical airfield for me to control I would have also put one of those companies over the other side and I'd have asked my Greek supporting troops well, I'd have basically positioned them around and probably put them in the, down in the valley, as in down inside the riverbed. So, when the Germans landed, they got a nasty surprise. If you can contain, if you can retain control of Maleme, then the German advance peters out quite quickly. They're not getting any seaborne troops through. 
they're not managing to counter, they're not managing to take an airfield. If they don't have an airfield, they don't have resupplies coming in. If they don't have the air bridge, they run out of supplies. And you get a big victory. Because even after they have the air bridge, they are still prepared, they are still losing. It's the 26th when the Germans finally get some supplies through. <coughs> well, they don't get the supplies through them. They are finally asked the Italian supplies. The Italian supplies actually only turn up once the British have started evacuating. Because the Royal Navy thinks we're well, doing an evacuation. Why well, we fight the Italians for it? Why are going to risk it? Sort of, we've got to concentrate on evacuating our troops. We can't go and attack them. And it's the Italians who make it. And they turn up with tanks as well, which really do help. While this is going on, what were the Royal Navy doing? Well, they were dying. There might not have been much air support. And trust me, the RAF tried to give what air support they could. But they didn't. It was a long way. It was the range, and there's a lot of other commitments going on. But this is where the British forces and British warships get damaged and sunk. The interesting thing here is the damage of HMS Formidable doesn't get mentioned in this, and she should be. As part of Operation Mac 3 on the 26th of May, she is used to try and strike Stuka bases. Because the idea is on the 26th of May, even though they are starting, remember, this one, 26th of May, the Germans ask for support. Evacuation begins on the 28th. 26th, they are trying to cut off support for these operations. They're trying to cut off the air attacks. So they are trying to take out air bases which have Fleet of Corps X and other units based on them. The problem is she's been involved in combat for 90 days. This is the exact scenario why the Royal Navy have been building HMS Unicorn. Because here is the advantage, disadvantage to the American versus British system. The Americans, of course, build lighter, bigger carriers overall, lighter in structural terms. Um, because they don't have the armour. But this meant they had space to store aircraft, or decomposed aircraft instead of parts, up in their rafters, which gives them an artificially high air group number. But it does mean this doesn't happen. She's at the end of the supply train, she is running out of aircraft, she's running out of supplies because air operations take a toll. They take a very physical toll. Even if your aircraft isn't shot down, it uses it uses its parts. One of the big issues in the Falklands War was the supply of spare parts, and it's the same in this point in the in operating in the Mediterranean. Think about how difficult it would have been to supply spare parts to the Far East at this point if you're having this trouble supplying spare parts to the Mediterranean to the other end of it. There is a five month delay as those parts are going round. Not five month. Five week delay. Sorry, and they get five months from. It's just not fun. So here is a summary of Crete. The Germans have a lot of luck and then they carry out, they do manage to carry out quite a successful operation. Because as this goes in, they bring in their mountain warfare troops who are very successful at fighting. They don't get the support of the populace they've been planning on. But they are aided by the British troops' war weariness. They have been beaten up in Greece. They have been beaten up in Northern Europe. They have been beaten up everywhere. They are tired. They haven't been given a break. And now they're doing this. And you might say, well, the Germans have also been fighting. Yes, but they've been winning. Winning versus losers, and losing does different things to your psychology. And honestly, Crete hadn't been prepared. We can 
And you can point to the fact that good old Freiburg hadn't had the time to do it. No, he didn't have the time to do it. But in the nicest way, and there have been seven commanders that soon running through Crete, but there had been units there since November 1940. So, yes, probably it was fair that the British lose in the end because they could have done a lot better job of defending the island. A lot better job of defending the island. They should have done a better job of the island, but they didn't. quite interesting how many risks the Germans take though, because the JU-52s and the L systems they use, they're really operating at the limits of their skill level, and they're operating from airfields which are not that good. So they end up losing aircraft to the infrastructure of both operations itself. Because again, the Germans, just as the Royal Air Force is distracted, focused under understandably on the Battle of Britain, and the Royal Navy is, whilst it's fighting the Battle of the Mediterranean, it's fighting the Battle of the Mediterranean and the Battle of the Atlantic. So it's focused on those things. And it has suffered losses in Norway. Not as many as the Germans did, not as devastating as the Germans, but it's suffered losses. It all means this is the Royal Navy that's, fight, uh, that's doing a lot of the fighting, but the British Army has also suffered massive losses. So it's it's harder for them to get going. And the theory was, of course, that these forces, W Force, 25,000 troops, would be, would be brought to Crete and they would be backed up by 8,000 Royal Navy MMBDOs and 10 to 12,000 lovely. Greek ally troops, so he would have had 45,000 troops, and that would have probably been a homogenous force. Plus, probably 14th Brigade as well, so that would have been another few thousand added on. But they weren't. Instead of these homogenous units being brought, sections of units, remainder of units, bits of units, Artillery units without artillery to fight as infantry were brought. Anti-aircraft gunners without anti-aircraft guns. Again, there are units using Italian, quite a lot of Italian captured Italian artillery. And these sort of things, which is fine, it's sensible, but send enough. They have about eight guns, 400 millimeters and four others, which are even smaller. It's just 75 millimeters. Do you know what's really annoying about Crete? Is you sacrifice HMS Formidable, you sacrifice all these ships for it, you sacrifice everything, and in the end, the decision about the success of Crete can either be put laid at the doorstep of one battalion commander misreading a situation under the stress of combat, which frankly anyone has a right to do. It happens. Brigade commander not handling that properly enough, perhaps by not reading the situation going, and deploying as many troops as they could, because let's be honest, the brigade commander could have withdrawn troops from those other battalions. It's not nice, it's going to stretch those other battalions, but they are can always fall back on the airfield. The airfield is the important thing you have to retain, and the longer you can retain that and stop the enemy getting it, they're not going to get supplies. And it's, it's like Singapore all over again, where if you stop the Japanese troops gaining control of the reservoir. They're running out of food and supplies. You aren't. For them to resupply, it's a long, long way. You, you've fallen back on all your supplies and your depots. But, once again, 
the British they held defending an island. The Navy do well. The Royal Navy can hold its head up high after Crete. And frankly, the individual soldiers and unit leaders can. It's not their fault. It's not Freyberg's fault. I would hate to beg the scenario's fault. Basically, someone needs to be put in charge of organising defence of the islands, and they need to have done it properly. <sighs> because there are so many little ways it could have been saved. As I pointed out, if we go back to that map, this one. You can save Maleme by securing both sides of the riverbed and enfilading the enemy troops who land in that riverbed with fire from both sides. You could make it virtually impossible for those aircraft to, land, to take off again and really take out their junkers and all these things by just plying up the fields. Yes, they will bring in paratroopers, but that will stop the resupply because the paratroopers aren't bringing anything which can deal with ploughed fields. So that stops the mountain divisions coming in. You could plough up the airfields yourself. Again, stop the mountain divisions coming in. Doesn't matter if you've got no mines, you can booby trap. To be honest, to stop aircraft being able to land and taking off takes a few hours with pick with a spades. You could have done that, and you could have done that all the way along at all those airfields, at all those landing areas. You can pick out Crete. Let's be honest. It's a very mountainous terrain. There aren't many places suitable for aircraft landing and taking off. Even in this period where aircraft you are rough strip capable, you could have reduced it. So, yeah. So, in summary, the what if of Crete is not enough work done with a spade. It's combat engineering. It's denial of access. And I hope the sound worked well on that, and I hope you enjoyed, and see you at the live. Take care.